Okay, let's start um, our Baylor St. Luke's Medical Center Interna International Virtual Roundtable Conference. Uh, I'm Dr. Koneru, uh, Srikant Koneru. I'm one of the uh, directors of uh, the Structural uh, Heart Imaging and the director of uh, Valve Clinic, and uh, I lead the mitral and uh, tricuspid valve committees. Um, uh, and I'm I'm trained in Australia doing cardiology and interventional cardiology. From there on, I moved to Cleveland Clinic, did my uh, structural uh, imaging and then CT and MRI. And I've been here in Baylor St. Luke's Medical Center, uh, Texas Heart Institute uh, over the past four years. And I have privileged with uh, working both with interventional cardiologists and cardiac surgeons. Um, so let me uh, welcome all the attendees and the physicians from Latin America, Middle East and the United States. So as part of our uh, mission to promote medical knowledge through educational programs, the International Center of Baylor St. Luke's in Houston, Texas, in collaboration with Baylor College of Medicine, is honored to host our 12th International Virtual Roundtable to our network of physicians, medical societies, and international medical community. So today's topic is, uh, is going to be extremely interesting. It's uh, robotic-assisted cardiac surgery and advanced minimal invasive technology. Um, so the objectives of, uh, of today's lecture is about to understand how robotic technology can help cardiac surgery and to understand the benefits of robotic surgery. So um, uh, first of all, um, we will have all the lectures presented uh, presentation by our speaker, Dr. Kenneth Leal. Uh, throughout his presentation, just feel free to submit questions or uh, via, the, via the chat box located uh, in the left, in the right bottom of your screen. And post presentation, we'll open the virtual roundtable with questions, comments, and observations from our panelists and from the audience. So before introducing our speaker for this afternoon, uh, I would like to welcome our Latin American panelists uh, who will join us after the presentation with, with their opinion. And uh, let's welcome Dr. Um, Andres Navarro from Ecuador. Uh, Dr. Navarro is a clinical cardiologist and a specialist in international interventional and endovascular therapies. A graduate from uh, Universidad San Francisco de, de Cueto in Ecuador. Uh, he completed his cardiology specialization at uh, the Universidad uh, Abata Interamericana in uh, Buenos Aires. And he then completed his fellowship in interventional cardiology and endovascular therapies in the Instituto cardiovascular in Buenos Aires. Uh, Dr. Navarro is a part of the cardiovascular uh, catheterization and interventional cardiology department at uh, Eugenio uh, Espejo Specialty Hospital and Hospital de los Valles in, uh, in Quito, as well as a professor at the USFQ uh, School of Medicine. Dr. Navarro is an author and co-author of numerous international books um, on interventional cardiology. And I would like to welcome Dr. Navarro. Welcome, Dr. Navarro. Hello, um, hello, everybody. Nice to be here and to share with us, with all of you. Now, uh, I would like to introduce Dr. Alejandro Ray from Mexico. Uh, Dr. Ray was trained at the Faculty of Medicine uh, of the National Autonomous University of Mexico. He completed his uh, postgraduate studies at the Cohen Hospital in Paris and he completed his cardiothoracic surgery at the Texas Heart Institute, Houston, Texas. Um, he's been a professor of surgery for the past 32 years uh, at the National Autonomous University of Mexico. He served the National Surgery. Uh, he, he received the National Surgery Award in 1980 to 82, and then again in 87, 88. And he's the Cardiovascular Fellow Award at the Texas Heart Institute in 92 and 93. He's been a president of uh, America, uh, Mexican Society of Cardiac Surgery from 2017 to 2019. And he's a chief cardiothoracic surgery and vascular at the American British Cordray Medical Center Hospital, Angeles uh, del Pedrigo in, you know, in Mexico City. Welcome, Dr. Ray. Um, I'd like to thank you doctors for joining us this afternoon. Uh, we'll be connecting with uh, you right after the lecture to obtain your observation and point of view. Now it's a privilege to introduce our speaker for tonight, Dr. Kenneth Liao. Um, Dr. Liao has completed his general surgery resident, uh, residency at uh, Brookdale University Hospital uh, Medical Center in Brooklyn, New York. 
and trained in cardiothoracic surgery at the University of Minnesota. Um, there, he started the robotic and minimally invasive uh, cardiac surgery program and uh, transcatheter aortic valve replacement program. Uh, he specializes in uh, adult cardiac surgery with an expertise in robotic and minimal invasive mitral repair, robotic coronary artery bypass, heart transplantation, left ventricular assist device implantation, and complex redo cardiac surgeries. Dr. Liav is the chief of the division of cardiothoracic transplantation and circulatory support at Baylor College of Medicine and the chief of uh, cardiothoracic transplantation and mechanical circulatory support at Baylor Centrix Medical Center. Is a program director of the Baylor College of Medicine, Texas Heart Institute, Cardiothoracic Transplantation Fellowship, and Baylor College of Medicine, Minimal Invasive Cardiac Surgery Fellowship. Welcome, Dr. Leo. Uh, it's a privilege to introduce you. Um, so uh, I would like you to, uh, to go ahead with the presentation. Hey, Dr. Ken, Dr. Carroll, thank you for your kind introduction. And uh, so I'm going to share my uh, slides. Can you hear? Can you see my slides? Can you hear me? That's right. Yes. Good. So uh, my topic today is the robotic assisted cardiac surgery, and um, that's an important topic because this is right now this is the routine surgery in our center. I've been performing this almost every week in robotic surgery cases, and I always want to find a specialty that uh, can represent as as profession represent the cardiac surgery, and the only profession that can find that similar or mimic or even close to cardiac surgery is the space uh, shuttle program. And as you can see that in the space shuttle program, you need a pilot, you need a crew, you need rely on high fancy technology. As you can see this generations uh, there is for successful space program, you need machinery, you need high tech. As you can see, first generation of space shift Apollo shuttle and the most recent one dragon from spacex the technology to make a huge difference technology to make it safer make it precise and make it make the mission can be accomplished and uh, efficiently and uh, cost effectively so i think uh, if you look at the cardiac surgery surgery development it's the same same course of similar to the uh, space uh, technology as you can see this picture was the first um, the open heart surgery that performed in the world at the University of Minnesota that's used a cross circulation technique because at that time there's no reliable heart lung machine to have to rely on the parents at, to you to be used a biological heart lung machine as you can see on this on the right side of the screen is a femoral parents femoral artery femoral vein is inserted and cannulated and the, and through a pump connect to the kids. Um, the carotid artery and then uh, uh, inter uh, <clears throat> internal jugular vein that uh, to insert is to the IVC and SVC to shunt blood away and the perfuse shunt the blood away from the heart and the perfuse the rest of the heart the, the body so they can operate on the heart without blood flooding the field. And then a few years later, after the initial cross circulation with parents, they developed this first generation of heart lung machine. Again, that uh, gradually the whole cardiac surgery changed. Now at the Baylor's and Luke's Medical Center, now we and uh, they have we're operating this fancy uh, big medical center, and every day we use the technology robot to operate on the patient, and um, exactly like what. Um, a space uh, program has achieved technology changed everything and as you can see the robotic uh, program and that was initiated in 1999 when the first generation robot was uh, developed and currently um, um, it's the fourth and even going to fifth generation of robotic uh, uh, device that can be used in the human body and uh, with the fourth and the fifth generation robotic device and then this, it is more user friendly for us, for the cardiac surgeons to use this device to operate on the, on the patient. So I started the robotic surgery in this first robotic surgery in 2003, I used first generation of robot that was very hard. And but uh, it is uh, doable, but then there's a lot of um, uh, Limit, there are a lot of limitations. At that time, there was only three arms. Now the robot has four arms and the make a user friendly has a memory and then the arms and they remember exactly where 
was the, the instrument you inserted the first doing the first move and the second move and then you go back to exactly the same spot and um, everything is much better now so that we can do a very complex uh, surgery with the robot inside the heart as you can see in this slide shows the current robotic procedures we're, uh, we're doing that the daily in the Bayless and Luke's medical centers are the listed here coronary artery bypass grafting use left internal memory artery or use bilateral internal memory to bypass the coronary arteries or use robot to do mitral valve repair or replacement even for reduce tricuspid valve repair replacement and the difficult uh, biventricular pace pacemaker pacing lead insertion especially to the left ventricle sometimes it is very difficult to insert to the uh, appropriate place for the uh, EP cardiologist for the uh, cardiac risk synchronization therapy and of course ASD VSD is relatively straightforward and then benign cardiac tumors so what is the robotic adventure surgical system currently there's only one robotic system is being used in the medicine practice that is the venture system is powered by state-of-art robotic technology the surgeon is in control and operates through the computer console the assistant surgeon is at the bedside near the patient and there are four robotic arms and uh, with fingertip control like a joystick and that there's seven degree of um, uh, seven degree of motion of the articulation of the old instruments and the motion scaling and tremor and uh, tremor deduction and uh, actually works very well and then then another striking feature of this device is the 3d uh, image very high resolution 3d image and then um, the surgeon basically view the the uh, the, the entire operative field in through the scope and that's under is projected with 3d image and then the instrument is tiny and it's flexible as you can see this is the side the tip of the instrument is only a few millimeters that allow us to do very fine maneuvers and the suturing cutting and um, the, and the holding and the and, and so on and then the structure is laid in a way the instruments laid in front of surgeon's eyes that basically you operate in front of your eyes and like in like reading a book make it very user friendly not fatigue and um, make <laughs> so why robotic surgery because people would ask it then we have doing the open heart surgery for years now why we need to do robot surgery as you can see this image is a typical coronary artery bypass grafting surgery cartoon uh, this is a three vessel bypass as you can see we typically use the left internal memory artery as a pedicle graph to bypass to the most important artery in the heart that's called left anterior descending artery we, we typically use the veins for the other less important artery and uh, this is a three vessel bypass but you can see the the difference between the the, uh, the advantage of coronary artery bypass grafting compared to the standing in, in in multiple studies that suggest, especially in a diabetic patient, the robot, uh, the coronary artery bypass grafting surgery has superior outcomes and survival benefits compared to standing, especially in the diabetic patient. And again, more more recent study and this suggests that uh, uh, the 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 primary endpoints all cause mortality, non fatal MI, non. Uh, CV mortality are much better with coronary artery bypassing group versus the standing group. However, the stroke rate, unfortunately, in the coronary artery, artery bypass group is high. It's typically related to surgery invasiveness, meaning during the open heart surgery, we have the cannula de order with the cross cam de order, with touch de order, and put the patient on a heart lung machine that introduced the risk of stroke. So, if we develop a surgery, not putting patient on a heart lung machine, not touching the aorta, not cross clamp the aorta, not stop the heart, that would significantly reduce the risk of stroke and they have the other benefits. So the reason why the bypass grafting works well in the diabetic patient is the long-term patency rate of the left internal memory artery. As you can see, this full up for four, 15 years, the graph still remained open over 90% of the time. And the other can't do it, unfortunately, not as good, such as vein graph by that time. And then by 10 years, 50% of, of them will be occluded. And radio artery is something in between. 
So this is a, a picture shows you the, the important and left internal memory artery that we need to harvest and has multiple branches coming out into the intercostal space. Typically in the open heart surgery, in order to harvest this artery, we need to open the whole sternum and then we take the artery. And then we typically put a hard lung machine to do this uh, to bypass. But then uh, in certain cases, this is even not doable because of heavy calcification in the acin aorta. As you can see, this vessel acin aorta is totally calcified, and then there's no way to cannula the aorta, and the femoral artery is, can, is calcified. In this kind of patient, the only way to do surgery is to do the off pump bypass surgery without even getting close to the chest to the aorta. So that comes through with little, this picture shows minimally invasive robotic bypass grafting with left internal memory artery to the LAD, to the targeted vessel. Sometimes we use the right internal memory artery to the bypass as well. So how do we do that? So, and then we just want to show you the image is very important ahead of time. This is a coronary artery angiogram shows the LAD is missing, but then how big it is and whether it's still available for bypass, we do not know on the angiogram. So the pre the we do CTA coronary angiogram with 3D reconstruction. That shows us how, whether there's any calcification in the LAD artery territory, whether the graph is still, LAD is still open. In this case, it is open and it clearly shows to us how deep is away from the, in, epicardial myocardium, so we know it's open. And also at the same time, we can see the lima, whether it's open or not, how far away is lima to LAD. And then, so we do a nice uh, 3D with image cardiologists, a nice 3D reconstruction and clearly show it to us, where's the lima, where's the rima, where's the LAD layout. And then we know exactly where's the target vessel. So we know that by the time we mobilize this artery with robot, we need to make a small incision to do direct anastomosis at appropriate intercostal space based on the CT guidance. And then this is another cartoon shows exactly how we're going to do this. So as a lima to LAD, we bring this artery downward towards LAD in the heart. So in the, at the appropriate in the cost of space, and then we place three chokers. And then uh, we bring the machine here with the camera choker is in the middle, fifth in the cost of space. Electro quadrate is on the third, and then the seventh in the cost of space with graspers. I we'll show you the quick uh, robotic um, image. Tell you we quickly assess the entire course of the LAD. As you can see, the uh, the clear the visualization of the robot is unbelievable image. And then this is two D image, but in for us we do a three D image, and then use the robot. We can quickly relax the quadrant. We divide. We mobilize the entire robotic. Uh, robotically mobilize the left internal memory artery at the pedicle graph. And then we will go to, as you can see, we'll find the branch in the coastal branches. We're going to clip the, clip the branches and then, and, and then divide uh, the branches. As you can see very quickly, and we clip everything. And then next, once it's clipped, we will and uh, mobilize the entire lens. You can see from the proximal origin all the way to distal bifurcation. Okay, and then um, it can be done very beautifully. And then next thing that we do is that open the pericardium to identify the target area of the LAD, and then based on the oh sorry. Based on the uh, target area, we'll decide whether that uh, where's we're going to put open up the intercostal space for direct anastomosis from the lima to LAD. In this case, the target area, as you can see, the LAD is right there. We see that. Okay. So once it's done, we use prepare the through a small incision in the costal, as I said, and prepare the left internal memory, good flow. And then we have. Um, this is a picture tell, tells you how exactly we do it. Temporarily accrue the LAD and then put it into coronary shunt and then sew the graph directly onto the, the place. This shows you we make a arteriotomy. Yeah, they see nicely open our arteriotomy. 
and then we're opening up nicely. Mm -hmm. Good. So we bring the other artery down. It can do uh, directly Lima sewing. We have a shunt put inside into cornering. And then we sew over the shunt and then between the Lima and the OAD. Of course, you can see the heart is beating, but in this area, the heart is not moving because the myocardial stabilizer holding this. Once we are down, and then we, um, the, we take out the shunt and then add the final stitch and then the bleeding is uh, controlled and then good flow. So that was uh, done and then we tie the suture. Yeah. Good. So that bypass is done. That's how we do this. At the end, typical incisions like this for one or two vessel bypass with Nima and Rima. And then in three or four weeks, and the patient can, can return to work and physical activity is very quick. And we can follow up on this. Um, another very common disease we use robot is the very pop, very common disease called mitral valve prolapse, mitral valve regurgitation. It affects a lot of people. And uh, in the US, every year we do about 5,000 uh, robot, uh, 5,000 mitral valve surgery. Every year is growing 4% per year. It's about 20% are down in minimally invasively, uh, but less than 1% are down with robotically, but it's slowly growing, okay? And different types of the, uh, the, the, the mitral valve prolapse, but the most common one is the uh, ruptured cortis, the type two Capondia classification. And you can see this is a picture typically shows the, the prolapsed <clears throat> posterior leaflets with the jet through the left atrium. And then this is a 3D picture shows the P2 prolapse. This is a picture shows the, um, the prolapse ruptured cordy of the mitral valve in P2 segment. And then the, this shows you the, the, the jet. It's very common P, uh, P2 lesion. So typical procedure for us is to do a wedge resection in the P2 segment and sew the surrounding leaflets together and put a band there. So this is a perfect procedure for robotic surgery because the intro myocardium in the left atrium and then the instrumentation visualization and the instrument is so perfectly designed robotic instruments for this type of procedure. This shows you the conventional surgery. Unfortunately, still been done in over 80% of the centers in the US, probably still more than the other part of the world. But as you can see, the mitral valve actually is located in the back of the heart. And then the, going from the front is not the proper approach. Actually going from the side behind the heart is a better approach. As you can see, going laterally through intercostal space, through the peripheral cardiopulmonary bypass with the cannula for drainage, and the use of robotic instruments will make it perfect sense. Robotic instruments allow the instruments to be inserted deep inside into the heart to do the fine procedures in the left atrium to repair the valve. And this is the typical setup and of the mitral valve surgery. And then as you can see this mitral valve, once the heart is arrested, we open the left atrium and, um, and, and then we do the, we put the retract in, into left atrium. We can see the mitral valve very well once the left atrium and uh, retractor is placed. And then, sorry, and then we find out we put the retraction sutures to place around the mitral annulus. So we can see the whole, in this case, the entire, most of the P2 segment is prolapsed and with ruptured cording. And then the, the, as you can see, we put typical 10 sutures, annular sutures along the annulus. As you can see, there's deep sutures in the, in the corner and then the robot can be placed very beautifully. Yeah. Now we see the prolapsed segment. Now this shows you the way do a nice uh, wedge resection of the ruptured cord. There's ruptured cord there and then we do the P2 segment resection. And then once it's done, this is the, you can see the big specimen, okay? And then we use the instruments to approximate sutures, the P1 and the P2 segments 
together in a two layer fashion with the, the Gore-Tex sutures in a continuous running suture fashion. Yeah, in two layers. And then we tie the suture. Mm -hmm. So the sutures are tied, so not push up. Yeah, beautifully done. Okay, sutures are tied. And then next thing that we do is to measure the um, size of the valve annulus, the ring, we're typically measured. And then it's a 21, this particular one. And then we put, push the sutures through the ring. And then we push down the ring, the band into posterior annulus. We use the knot tying device. They tie the knots on the annulus. And then next thing we have to test in this, as you can see, the valve is competent and then much. So this high, on the high pressure injection, normal setting, the valve is competent. So now we can have different variety of the procedures can be done. In this particular case, we can do a cryo maze to do the uh, to to do the um, left atrium maze procedure. This is a cryo maze. And we can sew the left atrium appendage through the same mitral valve procedure. Left atrium appendage here, we're gonna very slow you do the maze procedure now. Mm -hmm. So then you can see this, uh, the, the maze procedure around the pulmonary veins. We do a box lesion on pulmonary veins, okay. And then we sew the left atrium appendage from inside, close the appendage. And then we also place plastic of different, after annular plastic, we put some fissure closure. We see this, the two fissures, one is between P2 and P3 and P1, P2. So add additional sutures to close the, once we tested that, we use the sutures to approximate the fissure and then, and then we test the valve the ring is in. After this complex repair, we test the valve. The valve looks very good. So the variety of repair techniques we use to make it work. And then that, um, uh, make, so at the end, you can see the result looks, mitral valve repair looks very good, okay. So this is the end of the decision, the incision looks like. And um, so as you can see, the volume of us is increasing and then uh, for mitral valve repair and then re and the bypass surgery. And uh, as you say, we are the top 10 program in the country, in the US. As you can see, the, the more mitral valve surgery are done, the better the result as you show the volume outcome related. Our hospital has a high number of mitral valve surgery in the St. Luke's Medical Center were right in this area. And you can see the higher the volume, the higher the successful rate of repair. And as individual surgeon, surgeon, so and then I'm right here, very high number of robotics, uh, cardiac surgeon, mitral valve surgeons in the US and among this area. So that we do a very good uh, outcome, very low risk of uh, mortality and less than 0% so far. So I just want to stop here. As you can see, the technology is so advanced. Uh, this is the upper body, that's the old days. And uh, this is uh, now the uh, new, new practice of medicine, especially in cardiac surgery. Robotic surgery is here to stay and it can only then uh, become uh, a common practice. Okay, I want to stop here. Thank you for your attention. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Liao. It was an excellent presentation, great pictures and uh, great description of what the minimal invasive procedure is. Um, and I would like to uh, um, have some observations and opinions from our panelists and, uh, uh, and audience. We will proceed now to open a, a, our virtual roundtable and observations and comments from the panelists. Um, Dr. Ray, what, what, what's your observations or, or opinions do you have to share? You have to unmute the uh, Can I share my screen? Okay. Could you see it? Yes. Yes. Okay. Well, what I have to say is that the 
For robotic cardiac surgery, at least in my country, there is just a couple of uh, diagnoses that could be done with uh, robotics, with a Da Vinci. For example, the cabbage with uh, one or two vessels coronary artery disease. As uh, Dr. Liao talked, the mitral valve repair and some congenital and tumors uh, procedures could be done. In Mexico, in a private practice, one or two vessels, coronary artery disease, always go for interventional treatment. Mm -hmm. And we do not have a myxomatosis disease of the mitral valve. We in Mexico just have a rheumatic uh, heart disease, so it's very difficult to do a mitral valve repair. These kind of cases are coming down because of interventional procedures. Also, uh, I say that uh, more of our surgeons uh, that has a very good result with this kind of uh, operation are the, the very good uh, trained uh, uh, surgeons and the benefit, the advantage are uh, the hospital stay or to use less blood in the operating room and less complications. That's why the robotic assisted cardiac surgery has to be done. Okay, but um, it has to be performed by a selected cases. I mean, uh, for coronary artery disease in our practice in Mexico City, we just have three, four or more vessels coronary artery operations. Uh, also, we have to say that the selected cases has to have easy anatomy to perform the robotic uh, surgery. And as Dr. Liao says, experimental uh, hospital as Baylor San Luc uh, Medical Center are reference hospital for these kind of operations. To have a very good uh, trained people is not easy at the beginning of the procedure. What I have to say is that uh, in Mexico, we don't have a lot of uh, robotic cardiac surgeons because to have a very well trained is very difficult because the number of cases that are in a specialized hospital are very low. I can tell you that one of the most important hospitals in the round that is St. Luke's, Baylor St. Luke's Medical Center has one or two cases a week. That means that the experience is going to be done by the surgeon. Some of the people assisting with him of the physicians are going to have their own experience when they get back to their countries. So we don't have very well trained surgeons in Mexico. And that's why we are not doing robotic cardiac surgeons. Also in public hospitals, we don't have all the instruments or the equipment. For example, here, you can say the big difference between public that is in green in this color and private hospitals. Private hospitals has Da Vinci and in a public, ho in a public uh, hospital, we don't have uh, the enough qualification instruments to perform the, this kind of uh, robotic surgeon. Trained surgeons, the regular surgeons with a very low trained really trained surgeons in Mexico are this graphic. Also the instruments, we don't have many places in which you can perform these operations. For example, here, I, I have not done a, a coronary artery bypass operation in the last years with the one or two vessels. Most of them are three vessels and almost all of the cases has a previous percutaneous coronary interventions. Also the repairs are, are very difficult in my country because rheumatic heart disease are the most frequent pathology in Mexico. BSD or PDAs or atrial septal defects are more frequent, but they are not many because also interventional operation are performed with a very good results. I'm talking about a platzer and these kind of new devices. In a private hospitals, what we are looking is a short hospital stay, what means low cost and no complication. 
And what's the way to do this? The way to do is this is not with a with robotic. Here is with an excellent practice in uh, traditional hospitals and with a high quality volume because it's the only way to have better results and low cost. For example, talking about cost in private practice in US uh, dollars in my country, one prostatectomy is something about 16,000 uh, dollars. But if you use the robotic, it's more than four times. Same in open heart surgery. Look, the price of one open heart surgery in a private hospital is less than 30,000 US dollars. If you compare with a robotic surgeon, also, I'm talking robotic surgeon, for example, with uh, pericardiectomy. You can see the cost is four times higher than the other one. So it's not easy to have a very good volume and a lot of experience in poor countries like my country is, okay? What uh, we have in the literature, we have less automatic implantable cardioverter desfibrillate. In the in United States, you have a bunch of these cases <laughs> implanted, but here, we, I can tell you that we implant these kind of devices in one year in all the hospitals, less than 100 cases a year in all the hospitals in all the country. We have seen that the TABI is extremely expensive. So we are still performing aortic valve replacement with open heart surgery. Also, we don't have 11 regular CT device because they extremely high cost also less heart transplant than developed countries because of the expensive of this kind of procedures and the low quantity of donors that we have. What we do, better times of aortic cross clamp timing, better cardiopulmonary bypass time. We can do operations, for example, Lima to the LAD that I have done in the last eight or 10 years less than one hour. Like I learned at the Texas Heart Institute uh, more than 25 years ago with Dr. David Ott or with Dr. Michael Duncan or with Dr. Denton Cooley. They performed this kind of operation less than one hour with a patient extubated in the operating room and going to home after three days of, of hospital stay. Early extubation is what we do I mean, all of our patients, almost all of them, two or six hours after the operation, less blood products, better cost, better cost, low cost with better, better results. That's the difference between a very important reference center for robotic surgeon with one of the best cardiac robotic surgeons of the world, that is Dr. Liao, but we don't have uh, hands to perform this kind of cases. Dr. Ray, it was, uh, it was an excellent uh, observations and thanks for sharing all the, all the experience you, you gained all these years. Um, that's absolutely true. Like, you know, I, uh, I do agree that like you see a lot of uh, uh, rheumatic pathology um, and uh, I want to uh, have my own question just once for uh, Dr. Liao. Um, so um, with, uh, with, with the MAC and uh, with, with growing population and uh, getting all the elderly uh, with the increased uh, complicated mitral valves and you know, mitral anal calcifications and everything, um, how would you see uh, the minimal invasive procedures um, uh, coming into play in this? So I think the, as you, I appreciate Dr. Ray's uh, um, uh, in, input. I think I agree that we see different countries and different patient populations different. And even in the U.S., the practice model also changed. For example, 20 years in the U.S., most patients we operate upon in the U.S. are much healthier, younger, less, comor less of them has comorbidities. Now there's the major center, the indoor place, where it looks a lot of patients come here, they're on dialysis, they have a kidney failure, they have, um, they, they have morbid obesity, they have respiratory distress, they have reduced, all these things. And so 
sometimes you just feel like you cannot open. It's not, the patient cannot survive, but it's too invasive to open somebody's sternum for 80 plus year old elderly female who bone density is very frail. The only way that uh, she, the wound might heal is through the small incision rib space. So those are the cases that it'd be different than the swing robotic surgery certainly has a tech that advantage that. As you say that for those patients who have complex mitral valve surgery, in a patient with and the uh, MAC, a severe annular calcification, and then doing the, the annular debridement is difficult and uh, risky. So what we do is they combine the, with the use the transcatheter valve, TAVA valve, and then with minimally invasive uh, approach, open the left atrium, sometimes use robot, and we excise the anterior leaflet, mitral leaflet, we sew a patch, uh, uh, a PTFE felt, into the mitral annulus and then deploy um, transcatheter valve, a TAVA valve, typically a sapient valve directly into the mitral annular position and then use the balloon to dilate it, to anchor it. And we find out that probably the only way to do it through a transcatheter valve in the aortic valve in the mitral valve position. So a combination again is Technology, new technology, make us think about the, the treating the di patient differently, totally different way. Mm -hmm. And the old way of thinking is through the open chest. Everything is to be fast, and pump, and cross cam, and so on. But nowadays, and then actually with, of course, with experience and the, the speed is not too bad. Actually, robotic and uh, bypass surgery, robotic mitral valve surgery is very precise for my. For robotic mitral, uh, mitral valve surgery, we only give one dose of cardioplegia. So all the, every procedure is done within an hour intracardiac maneuver, repair and replacement will be done within the one cross camp. So that has minimal uh, um, an impact on the heart recovery. And then the post-op recovery is uh, very significantly better with robotic surgery. And the uh, one thing we noted obviously the the transfusion blood loss is significantly less in the robotic approach because most of the bleeding is simply from bigger incision from the bone marrow opening. And then so with, uh, especially with patient, a lot of patient nowadays with platelet dysfunction in the renal failure patient, if you do the, the stenotomy that the healing is going to be a problem. Mm -hmm. And uh, especially those patients who have those kidney transplant now come back eating to have this mitral valve surgery and so on. And then this, the robotic has a unique approach. Of course, again, we're, uh, we're lucky we're in the major tertiary center. We get a lot of uh, referrals coming from all over the place so that we're able to have a lot of experience of doing this type of surgery. And then the, of course, building a team is also very important that we can be very efficient to do this kind of procedure in the OR. And then there was never really a struggle at all. And then oh, there's some study analyzed the cost of uh, robotic surgery versus conventional open heart surgery. It turned out there's not much difference, actually. The reason being the robotic uh, uh, minimum invasive surgery significantly re reduced the hospital stay and they've shortened the return to work so that, that the hospital stay, ICU stay, blood transfusion, and extubation time that shortened. Everything actually cut the cost. And then obviously at the end, it didn't really have any cost issue for the hospital. And then, but the advantage is for the patient to return to work quickly, less complication and, uh, and less blood transfusion. We have not seen the minimal invasive approach that if we're not touching the aorta and then that the stroke risk is now basically zero. So those are the certain unique advantages of the robotic surgery, especially in the elderly patient, high risk patient have seen the changes. Um, thank you, Dr. Uh, Dr. Navarro, uh, you have any observations or opinions to share? Yeah, um, me as, a, as an interventional cardiologist, I think that Ecuadorian reality is very similar to Mexico. No? Uh, very, very similar. Mm -hmm. um, we have a lot of uh, difficulties in economic ways like, uh, you know, uh, I know that uh, robotic surgeries are done, but just in abdominal and uh, urology, but not done in cardiology and to replace valves or to do a cabbage. 
Um, and also uh, me as, as being a, as, uh, as an interventional cardiologist is like, we have very, very good differences between a, 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 a cardiac surgeons and, and, and interventional cardiologists. So mm -hmm. it's like, we have to create, uh, to create a, a very good heart teams so that we can choose the best, uh, the best um, solution for the patients. No, I think that that the hybrid uh, hybrid uh, procedures are going to be the future. LED is like the master of, of mm -hmm. the heart. So, and we know that the benefits of bypass. So we know that. And also as, as, as interventional cardiologists, we have been doing a lot of CTOs and we can see that the 60 or 70% of, of the artery are, are right coronary artery. So it's not so much the LED. So yeah. I think that uh, making uh, a very good heart teams with good cardiac surgeons and making with, with good uh, imaging people and with good planning, I think that patients will have all the best for, the, for them. It's true. That's the, the, those are like really great points. Um, yeah. Um, the the hybrid techniques, as you alluded, uh, we we started to do a, a lot of them with Dr. Liao. Uh, now he can actually go ahead and do the minimal invasive limb or LED, and um, and we'll come back and do the PCI of the circumflex or RCA, which makes it like uh, um, saving the sternotomy and uh, and the time and the effort, um, and um, and getting the LED the appropriate blood flow with an appropriate vessel. Um, um, Dr. Leah, uh, what do you think the, the future of minimal invasive techniques, given that the growing uh, percutaneous valves and, uh, and everything going on, um, what would be the extended yeah. role of this? I think uh, the, 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 again, as you can see that uh, the involvement of what's the best medicine is probably put the patient in the center. And uh, I think the hybrid approach probably that's the way to go. Mm -hmm. We know certain catheter technique now works very well. For example, TAVA has demonstrated superiority in the high risk patient mm -hmm. and then the moderate risk patient then, or even for the low risk patient and elderly patient for better than the conventional aortic valve replacement surgery, period. There's no argument. And then the only difference now is to argument that the observation is long-term for the younger patient where the TAVA still holds the long-term benefits compared to the conventional surgery. That's something that needs to be decided. For the uh, hybrid, for the coronary artery intervention, I agree with uh, Dr. Navarro that more and more in our hospital, we do this, um, the hybrid approach and then cardiologists would stent the non lad or uh, the relatively less complicated and uh, stenting and uh, to the, the coronary arteries. But for the complex uh, bifurcational lesion involving the LAD and the complex calcified uh, distal left main uh, involving bi uh, bifurcation, trifurcation, probably uh, we do this more hybrid robotic NEMA LAD later with standing. It's easy for everybody. It's less risky for the patient. And the cardiologists also do a good job. You do a straight uh, standing, put it in a big proximal uh, and they target uh, coronaries. And I think that's right to do. And for the mitral valve, and then I think a typical example will work very well in our place on center. We have image cardiologists, interventional cardiologists, and the surgeon. Sometimes if I receive the referral for mitral valve surgery, your patient is very frail and had multiple redos and then uh, has liver dysfunction. I would ask cardiologist, take a look. Can this patient be clipped? Do a mitral clip? Is this pathology suitable for, for clip? If it's so, and then your patient, the LP function is poor, why not, why not go ahead clip it? And then most of the time clip works well and a certain pathology typically works very well. Sometimes it might come back in certain pathology. And then if that's the case, we have seen that patient's heart function improved a little bit after mitral clip. And then later patient delay had delayed um, uh, regurgitation. And then we come back to a minimum invasive surgery. So those things are be, uh, we evaluate very 
uh, closely as a team approach and uh, certain pathology is very good, very easy and uh, should be done with um, uh, surgical repair, especially robotic mitral valve repair that uh, is so minimally invasive and it's good reliable result and then uh, it can be done in a very reproducible way and uh, with good outcome and then we we should go for surgery. So a team approach is the right way to do. And the image technology also made a huge difference, make our surgery much easier, more precise. So each time before I go to surgery, I will discuss with our image cardiologist, Dr. Kanaru is one of them. We look at the 3D image. I can tell you exactly, I don't need to spend much time intraoperatively to, to assess the valve because it's in my, uh, it is, a printed out book already in front of my eyes and I have an image printed in my brain. I go in, just do the work, cut that piece out and sew it and then we're done. And then sometimes we can even measure, pre-measure the size of the mitral annulus. So we can put a ring that uh, is already pre, almost pre-selected. So everything that uh, if the surgeons and the cardiologists work together and the interventional image cardiology, I think we're very powerful and then uh, make uh, a great team and then everything will be done seamlessly and the patient will benefit the most. Oh, that's, that's great, thank you. Um, now, Dr. Leah, what, what do you think about like, you know, this, this multivalvular lesions and multivalvular problems? Um, you would see the future being having like a, an aortic and mitral valve, um, a dual valve a surgery rather than like having a tower and then like approaching the mitral valve to surgery, like a minimal invasive. Yes. So we have seen that in certain patients that multi-valve surgery, open heart is open my approach is very risky, especially for elderly patient. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we have staged that. For example, we stage it if the TAVA, and then if my aortic valve is severe, we go with TAVA. Mm -hmm. And then once the TAVA is down, we then fix the mitral valve. And if it's, it can be clippable mitral clip, do the mitral clip. If not, we'll do a minimally invasive repair, or we can do a trans catheter, trans through the apical mitral valve replacement procedure. That's another thing we could do. A lot of things, and then sometimes we can. Patient had previous coronary artery bypass grafting surgery. We had a stent put it in first, and then we do a minimally invasive mitral valve repair replacement tricuspid valve. We can do a double valve through minimally invasive approach and for the tricuspid and the mitral, or from the aortic and mitral. So. The combination, by the way, have not been able to do triple valve minimally invasive, but we have done aortic and the mitral, and the mitral and the tricuspid because they are proximity of the both valves. Mm -hmm. So a lot of possibilities, and that can be done as long as we, each of us use their, their specialty, their best approach and the best technique, and then combination of both, and use the best of both worlds, and then we can do a lot. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks. The, I thank the speaker, panelists, and the audience for their time. Uh, now, before we uh, um, we end, any last minute words before we go, Dr. Navarro or Dr. Lay, Dr. Ray. No, any, any comments? Any? any, Dr. Ray, any yeah, any I want to hear your comments. comments. Yeah. No, I think the. There are many comments that I would like to do, <laughs> but the, the, the summary that we could have of this uh, conference is that uh, it's true what Dr. Navarro says. I mean, is different countries, different pathology, mm -hmm. different pathology, different kind of surgery. Yeah. I mean, not all of us, we have the same technology that has another countries. I think that the, we have to work with the hands that we have. That's all. <laughs> I think the same as Dr. Ray is like Mexico and Ecuador are very similar. So I think that that's the way we have to go to make the, a good decision, a good planning and for the best of the, for the patients. And that's it because we don't have everything now. We have to, to do what, what what we know to do and with the things that we have. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Again, uh, thank you doctors for your time this evening um, and um, have a um, very good night and see you guys. Good night. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Bye. Bye. <laughs>